Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to a uh, devotional this morning. Um, I know I haven't done one in a uh, long time, and so I, I wanted to bring you all uh, up to date on some of the things going on. Um, <laughs> 2023 was a uh, rough year for me, to say the least. Uh, my mom went into hospice back in the fall. And then, of course, we were going into the holidays. And um, just recently, uh, she's just slowly gone downhill. And um, she's quit eating and drinking. So um, it's it's been a little bit uh, rough. And I've been devoting a lot of my time uh, to taking care of that. But um, the other day I went to see her and she was all perky and knew who I was. She, she doesn't have cancer or anything. She is, um, suffering from congestive heart failure and dementia. She's had a lot of many strokes. And so I'm thankful that she still knows who I am. I, I ask her that a lot and she'll say my name. So that, that gives me a lot of peace and comfort. But, uh, I just ask that you would pray for me at this time. Um, while we go through this, it, it's hard to lose a parent. I lost my dad in 2012 and, uh, now my mom, she, she'll be 85 in May if she can hang on that long. But, um, anyway, uh, I covet your prayers in that. So just a little bit of, of information to let you know what's uh, going on. I've wanted to do the devotionals and I've wanted to do some craft videos, but, uh, I just haven't been able to find the time. So, um, I'm going to do one this morning and I'm probably going to do another one uh, right away because I've got two things that's just really burning on my heart and um, hopefully this will uh, encourage you all and uh, I'm mostly preaching to me on these two subjects. The one I'm preaching uh, or teaching today is um, we are in the world but not of the world and so this has really been burning on my heart and then another one uh, that's really been burning on my heart because I'm personally dealing with it is uh, be anxious for nothing. So those are uh, two things that's really been uh, on my heart lately. And hopefully this will encourage you all while I try to encourage myself in the Lord. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive right into uh, the word. So dear Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day uh, here in Missouri. It is uh, almost 60 degrees and the sun is shining and I know other parts of the country are blanketed under feet of snow and so it's just a little bit different everywhere but I ask that everyone within the sound of my voice that hears this today would be encouraged and lifted up and uh, and that this would be for your glory and that you would give me the words that you want me to say in Jesus name. Amen. So something that uh, has been on my heart, like I said lately, is to is the it, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And I've got a lot of scriptures today, um, and I will uh, call them out. And whenever one of these days, when I get the time to study how to do these YouTube videos and I can learn how to put these scripture references up, I will do that. But there is something sticky on my table. This is the side my grandkids sit on all the time. So Lord only knows, it's probably pancake syrup. But anyway, um, the key verse that I want to read today is John 15, 18 through 20. And I'm going to put my old lady glasses on so that I can read. And it says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So Jesus is talking to his uh, disciples here and he's telling them, he's trying to prepare them that um, they're going to be rejected. They're going to be hated. They're going to be, all of them are going to actually be killed except for John. Um, and they didn't, it's, it's not like they didn't try to kill him. They boiled him in oil and everything else. And finally they couldn't kill him and they exiled him um, to an island. But anyway, um, I experienced this myself uh, when I was a, a kid. My, I've told you all before, if you watch my devotionals, my mom and dad put me in a Christian school in 1976. Um, and uh, the main reason that they did that was because I don't know, for some reason, I have been bullied all of my life, ever since I was a small child. I would go down to the bus stop and my next door neighbor would just beat me up. It was a boy 
And he would just beat me up for no reason at the bus stop. I don't know why. I mean, I was best friends with his little sister. Um, and then I would get to school and there was this girl that would be waiting uh, on the playground when I came out to um, beat me up. And I didn't even know her. She wasn't even in my class. She just wanted to beat me up. And so they also didn't like how I was falling through the cracks in school. And, and so anyway, enough was enough. And I've told you this story before. They made a great sacrifice to put me in a little Christian school um, where I just absolutely thrived. And I went there from 7th through 12th grade. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. Um, that was six of the best years of my life was my later years, my 7th through 12th grade. But the only thing I can figure is, you know, sometimes... The world just hates us. And when I was, and I'm going to share something personal, and, and, and you all know I'm pretty transparent, but at the age, I was always a really happy child, uh, despite all of that. I, I, I just was a happy child. And um, sometimes people just that are not happy just don't like happy people. And I think that was probably some of what they were seeing in me. Um, maybe these kids came from broken homes. Maybe they... They just didn't like the fact that I was happy, but at the age of nine, I was raised in Pentecostal churches. Um, at the age of nine, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that don't understand what that is, um, I encourage you to study about that and 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 read about that. Uh, but and I was going to a Baptist school, and so believe me, I got persecuted about that too. But. Um, not quite so much as, you know, being beat up. That was more of a kind of a verbal thing. And then the, I got bullied at my church, believe it or not. Um, I was the only kid in a very large church that was going to a private Christian school, and I got made fun of for that. So, but I, I chose not to concentrate on the bullying part of my childhood. I was a pretty happy child, despite all of this um hatred and 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 uh, anger that was directed at me that I, I didn't even know why. So anyway, I, I think sometimes, and I've come across this in my adulthood, people don't understand what it is that you have on the inside of you and and they'll just attack it. And Jesus explains this very plainly to his disciples. When he says, you know, the world hated me before it hated you to the point of, of sending him to the cross. And so why should you expect to be treated any differently? And so I guess that's that's where I'm coming from. But I titled this devotional in the world, but not of the world for this very reason. Right now, the world is is not a happy place. It's not a fun place. It's not uh, a joyful place. It's it's a place filled full of war and anger, and pain, and sorrow, but the thing that's encouraging about this is we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We're here tempor as Christians, as believers, we're here temporarily. This is not our home. This is temporary. Our home is an eternity with Jesus, and so what we go through on earth, um, the things that we go through sometimes that we don't understand we are living in a, in a very fallen world, and it's never going to be utopia. You know, these politicians and these people that are, that are you know, they think, well, if we get rid of, you know, all of this, then, then we'll be, you know, for instance, just saying, get rid of all the guns. Get rid of all the guns, and all these shootings will stop. No, they won't, because we live in a sinful, fallen world with sinful men and women, and They'll find a way to murder somebody, whether it's with a gun or not, or, you know, they'll get guns anyway, whether they're legal or not. So, you know, and I'm not here to debate that issue. I'm just saying we live in a very fallen world where we have sin nature inside all of us. And until you've given yourself to Christ and you are, and he, he enters into us through the Holy Spirit, we, we are not going to be, ever be in a utopia in this world. So I'm going to go on and read some more. And the next scripture I read is 1 John 2, 15 through 17. That's all the way over here. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world 
or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Um, I love that scripture. Uh, do not love the world or the things in the world. And that's the thing. They're things. They're just things. Um, this is something that I've learned later in life. You know, when I was a lot younger, um, I just really concentrated on things. I just wanted things. I wanted new clothes. I wanted new furniture. I wanted a new house. I wanted, you know, new, new, new things, things, things. And, and the older you get, you realize they're just things. And a lot of times it's just clutter. And um, we spend so much money on things that we just don't even need. Uh, and so then the next scripture that I'm going to read is 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. And that one is this one. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous night or light. I'm sorry, who once were not, not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we are a royal priesthood. So the next scripture that I want to read and, and priesthood basically means, you know, we're Jesus gave the commission to the disciples to go out and preach the gospel and we are all royal priests. We are all called to, to that mission, not just the 12, first, you know, 11 disciples. Um, they picked another one uh, right after Judas betrayed Christ and, and they were 12 again. But we are a royal priesthood. We are to carry the gospel. We are to preach the gospel and teach the gospel to those around us. And then the next verse I'm going to read is in actually in the Old Testament. This is 1 Chronicles 29, 15. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. Now, this is in the Old Testament. Where they were, you know, the people of Israel were always, they always felt like aliens until they were able to come into their own land. And I could go off on another branch about that too, but I'll save that for another time. Um, and, and there's some of my, uh, there's some folks out there who watch me who are um, some, some uh, Messianic Jewish people. And so they probably understand this more than anyone. Um, everywhere they go, they're hated. They're not wanted. They're, they're persecuted. And now they're in their own promised land, the land that God promised to Abraham, and they're still persecuted. Um, and the world is, is turning against them again. And this just grieves me to no end because, uh, a side note, we need to pray for the people of Israel and the peace of Jerusalem um, because this is this this is going the wrong direction again. I, I feel like as a lover of history, just people not learn anything. Do they not learn anything from history? Uh, let's not go down that road again. And uh, it seems that's that's the direction that we even in America, our, our young people are all against Israel and they're all for terrorists and Hamas. And it's like, oh, my Lord. But um, anyway, so where do we go from here? Um, I excuse me a minute. Where do we go from here? So how do we be in the world and not of the world? And um, so we're to be different. Basically, uh, we're not supposed to look like the world. We're not supposed to talk like the world. We're not supposed to act like the world. Um, and that's the fruits of the Spirit. So I'm going to read the fruits of the Spirit. That's Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Let's get to Galatians 5, 22 through 23. I have so many sticky notes in my Bible. Got to pull which one. Okay, here we go. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. This is the fruits of the Spirit. Now, this is how we are supposed to be as Christians. And I'll be the first one to say, uh, sometimes I don't always have good fruit. Sometimes I don't do the right thing. But that's because we are still on this earth and living in a fallen 
sinful nature, and I have to ask the Lord to forgive me a lot. But uh, anyway, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's one that's really hard for me. Um, against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Um, man, I tell you what, the Bible is the words of life, and it just cuts. It, it is a sword, and it cuts, and it even cuts into me um, so much. And so these fruits of the Spirit, you know, gentleness, uh, love, peace, joy. You know, we can have joy in the middle of this crazy, messed up world. We can have joy in the fact that we have salvation through Jesus Christ and we're not going to be here uh, forever. We are. This is a temporary home. That should give us all joy. Um, we shouldn't take joy in things. It, things are just going to, they're going to, and people, people will fail you. Um, family will fail you. Friends will fail you. It's just, it's just a fact of life. Um, you know, Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. That even his very own chosen ones were not perfect. And that's also should be encouraging because I'm not perfect. And if he can use those men, he can, he can use you and I. Um, so how are we supposed to act? That's one of the ways that we are supposed to act. We're not supposed to look like the world. We're not supposed to speak like the world. So in, in speaking like the world, um, self-control, I don't know how many times, and I pray this prayer just about every morning, Lord, you know, I heard this from Joyce Meyer. I'll have to give her credit for this. Put your arm around your shoulders and your hand across my mouth. Uh, my personality is very cut and dry. It's very black and white. I, I take things very literal, and I am very blunt sometimes, and, and sometimes I can even be tactless, and I know that about myself because I'm just so, like I said, black and white that I, I just, I don't sugarcoat things. I don't beat around the bush. I, I'm just, uh, there it is. And that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. And so I have to ask the Lord. And I can tell you, he answers that prayer because there's been so many times, um, even, you know, as early as, as yesterday, there's situations where I just want to just, just really spit it out at you. And the Lord literally shuts my mouth. I mean, you know, it, it, it just, and it's a good thing because if he didn't, I would just, well, it would not be good. Let me just put it that way. Um, I, I, I had a phone conversation with someone the other day that uh, I'm not going to mention names and I'm not going to um, tell you who it is, but every time I talk to this person, um, the conversation, you know, I was talking about uh, my mother with a family member and every time the conversation turns to it's all about that person I'm like my mother is dying I'm telling you about my mother and all you can talk about is you and I just I just really wanted to let it fly and I I, I even had a speech prepared and it just it just wouldn't come out it just wouldn't come out thank the Lord because I probably would have went too far um, and, and so that's that, that's that self-control. That's, and it wasn't me having self-control. It's the Holy Spirit giving me self-control, um, and shutting my mouth. However he does that is I'm grateful to him because like I said, I, there's probably times when I really would have gone too far. And, and so the Lord just shuts my mouth. And I mean, occasion after occasion comes up where I just really want to, somebody might really, really hurt me. And I want to retaliate, and I can't. And so I mean, I'm not saying that sometimes you don't have situations where you have to have a confrontation with people, but um, I could get really hateful, and it, and, it, and it just, the Lord just shuts my mouth. And, you know, sometimes I'll just shut the conversation down and say, well, we just can't go on. From... Anyway, um, 
So that's, that's how we're supposed to act. We're supposed to be kind. We're supposed to have a smile on our face. We're not supposed to look like we've been walking around baptized in pickle juice. Um, when we go to the, when we go out in public, you know, we shouldn't be walking around like, you know, we, we want to be the light of the world. Jesus says that's what we are. We're salt and light. So we want to be the light of the world, uh, to the world of him, through him. And um, so, you know, that's how we're supposed to act. That's one of the fruits of the spirit too. Patience. And Lord knows this is the one that I have to work the most on. That's probably number one before my mouth even is patience. I'm not a patient person. I'm a very uh, type A person. I'm ambitious. I'm driven. I want to get things done. I make a decision and I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I want to do it now. And sometimes it doesn't happen now. And that's probably my biggest, uh, my biggest flaw, personality flaw is I just don't have patience and I don't have patience with, um, a lot of things. I, I don't like to wait and, uh, I, I get aggravated, and so um, that's another one of those fruits of the Spirit, and I'm, I'm still working on that one. I'm 59. I'm still working on that one. Um, joy, I, I really don't have that much of a problem with. Um, peace, I'm pretty, I have pretty much peace. Uh, goodness, faithfulness, uh, I don't really have a problem with those things, but I will tell you that the uh, self-control and the long suffering, those are two that I still need to work on. Those two fruits are not ready to pick yet, okay? <laughs> so um, another way that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this a little bit, and, and it might it might offend some people, but you know, the word of, of God is not touchy feely, warmy, fuzzy, uh, all the time. Um, Jesus again didn't write this. I mean, the Holy Spirit did not inspire people to write this, and then it changes with cultural norms, or what society thinks is cultural norm. It's the same. Yesterday, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about modesty and what I see in the church. So if the church is supposed to be in the world and not of the world, a lot of what I'm seeing in, in the church sometimes is you can't tell the difference between the church and the world. Um, and that's happened within about the last 50 years. I can remember as a child going to church. Um, that was a very special day. And I'm not saying that, you know, you got to wear, you know, your Easter outfit every week and you got to wear your Easter bonnet every... But what I'm saying is, is people... 50 years ago, it, it was a lot more, um, there was respect for the house of God. And I, I, I'm just going to relate a story that um, my dad, before he passed away, they were going to a, a church, a non-denominational church up in St. Louis. And you had to walk up a flight of stairs to get to the main part of the building, the sanctuary. And he was walking up some stairs and he looked up. And there was a young lady walking in front of him and he could see all the way up her dress as she was walking up the stairs. He wasn't trying to, I mean, my dad was always a very, he didn't do that kind of thing. And so he was upset about it. And he told my mom, he's like, you know, he said, the way some of these young girls dress in church, it's just, he said, I don't know how, and you know, my dad was in his seventies then he goes, I don't know how these young men can pay attention to the sermon. And I know some of you are going to be like, well, men have, you know, but ladies and, and girls and the way we dress uh, says a lot about us. And right now our little girls are just inundated with the world. It's all around them. We didn't have cell phones that you could access the internet. We didn't have iPads. There was only three or four channels on TV. We didn't have you know, all these cable channels. We didn't have computers that we could get on. And our children are being inundated with sex and and seductive clothing and on, on just every second of the day. Um, I see on Facebook, uh, 
in town, you know, people are complaining. My daughter got sent home because she was wearing something that was considered inappropriate. Well, probably needed to be sent home. And if your mother dresses that way, well, how do you expect the kids to dress that way? So as older ladies, it, it's up to us in the church to be an example. And not that anybody wants to see a 59-year-old dress seductively, but I mean, um, you know, nowadays we're all caught up in trying to look younger than what we are and trying to dress younger than what we are. And um, how do we expect our daughters to, to act any different? And the role models that they have nowadays, all these pop stars and the and the, the twerking that they do and the gyrations and the hardly got their bodies covered and opening their legs during dance moves. And I mean, I could go on and on. Um, but I'm going to read a scripture, one more scripture about this. This is 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. And I'm going to explain something here. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with, prop, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Okay, I'm going to read you an article because when Paul wrote this, I'm going to pull my article over here when when the apostle paul wrote this people think oh he's preaching against and there you know there was a, a holy holiness move, movement early on the you know the 1900s um to where everything was based on uh outward appearance you didn't cut your hair and women wore the beehive hairdos and they wore dresses they couldn't wear pants they couldn't wear makeup they couldn't wear jewelry because they they took this out of context and so we need to read this in a historical context and so me liking history I just looked up the way women dressed in the Roman period this is not a Christian site okay that I'm reading from this is a secular site this is about the Roman uh, the way Roman women dressed and this would have been what Paul uh, was witnessing so much like today, hair for the Romans was as much an expression of personal identity as clothes. Hairstyles were determined by a number of factors, namely gender, age, social status, wealth, and profession. A woman's hairstyle expressed her individuality in the ancient Roman world. How one dressed one's hair was an indication of a person's status and role in society. Hair was a very erotic area of the female body for the Romans. And attractiveness of a woman was tied to the presentation of her hair. As a result, it was seen as appropriate for a woman to spend time on her hair in order to create a flattering appearance. Hairdressing and its necessary accompaniment, mirror gazing, were seen as distinctly feminine activities. Lengthy grooming sessions for women were tolerated, despite writers such as Tertullian and Pliny commenting on their abhorrence for time and energy women dedicated to their hair. However, the numerous depictions of women hairdressing and mirror gazing in tomb reliefs and portraiture is a testament to how much hairdressing was seen as part of the female uh, domain. It was seen as much an indication of wealth and social status as it was of taste and fashion. Um, it said that, you know, women concentrated tons of time back then on their hair and their their makeup and their jewelry and all of this and then mirror gazing and so it was all about self all about me all about you know how i look and we actually are seeing that again today and again please don't take this out of context but the amount of time and money that women in america i don't know if this is true anywhere else spend on hair and nails and makeup and jewelry and designer handbags it's like holy cow um wow i mean i think that's what he's talking about i don't think he's talking about you can't braid your hair and you can't wear jewelry and you can't have a nice you know it's it's not saying you can't have nice things and you can't look nice 
But when you take it to another level to where that is, that is what you're obsessed with is your looks. Um, and that goes for men too. I mean, now men are starting to, you know, go to spas and, and, and like, again, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with looking nice, um, and having nice things. But when you, when it consumes all of your time and all of your effort, and that's all you think about is, you know, what kind of nails can I get done this week? What kind of hairdo, hair extensions, whatever. Um, I got to have this designer handbag that's got to match these designer shoes. And, and then I got to have, you know, this kind of jewelry. And I will not be satisfied with an engagement ring that's less than a carat and a half. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. It's, and this is with everything, uh, moderation. I mean, when you put, an, it becomes a God. And I think that's what Paul is talking about as far as, as modesty. And then the other thing that goes hand in hand in that is dressing modestly. And dressing modestly is not uh, to be seductive, especially in the church. And like I said, I see, I see young women come in sometimes and now not, not my church lately. I have not seen that, but I mean, in the past I've seen in churches uh, where you're just like, oh my gosh, could you not go back in and put something else on? Because Whoever, whatever young man's going to be sitting around you is not going to be looking at the <laughs> at the preacher <laughs> paying attention to the sermon. Um, and so, like I said, it can go for men too. I mean, we in America, we're obsessed with, you know, we're so prosperous and we're so blessed that we just spend money on the, some of the stupidest stuff and, and, uh, and and going overboard, you know, here in America, I don't know if you all have, are familiar with uh, Dave Ramsey, but he talks about, you know, money and, and being good stewards of our money. And so, you know, whatever our paycheck is, if we get $1,000 a week, we spend $1,000 a week and we have credit cards so that we can have these things. And again, these things are just things. They're things of the world. And we're not to be of the world. We're just here temporarily and we can't take these things with us and trust me ladies you're not going to be able to take the hair and the nails and all that with you because you're just going to rot in a casket okay <laughs> until you get a glorified body and it ain't going to look like all that anyway um and then i'm going to talk about one other thing and this might be controversial too but lord knows i don't shy away from controversy um and going back to that, I'm not saying you can't have a designer handbag. I'm not saying you can't go to the beauty shop. I'm not saying you can't get your, ha your hair and your nails done. I'm just saying when it becomes the whole focus of every day that, that it's a problem. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about tattoos. Oh boy, here we go. There's only one scripture as far as I know, that mentions tattoos, and that is actually in the Old Testament. And again, I'm going to put this in historical context. Um, this is Leviticus, so this is Levitical law. This is Levitical 19.28. And it says, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. Wow, okay, so this is a touchy subject because there's so many people that have tattoos. And again, you know, there's people coming to the Lord as new Christians and they're just tatted up all over and it doesn't bother me a bit. Um, and and tattoos in and of themselves don't really bother me. And And when this was written, this was Levitical law. This is the law of Moses. He was talking to the people about that a lot of these things, tattooing back then was considered um, pagan. Uh, it, they were tattooing themselves with, with pagan symbols and things like that, and they th that just was not acceptable to God as far as for his chosen people. And so it's, I don't, I'm not going to go and say it's a sin to get a tattoo, uh, Again, this is this is something that is between you and the Lord. And, and you know, Scripture tells us, do everything as unto the Lord. So if you call yourself a believer and you're tattooing not nice things on your body, I would say, yes, that's wrong. Um, and 
there are people that have scriptures tattooed on their arm because, you know, they've lost a loved one or they'll have their loved one's tattoo name on there. I'm not going to I'm not going to say that that's wrong again but what I'm saying is when it becomes an obsession and we all know that it's expensive and uh, to get a tattoo and so you know some people have just a little heart on their ankle or you know what I I'm not talking about that I'm talking about some of the demonic symbols that I see on people some of the uh the scary things that are tattooed on them, you know, um, it just, again, I don't think that has any place when you're a believer on our body and, and my cuckoo clock is going off. I was trying to get this done. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is everything that we do should be as unto the Lord. And just before you do something like that, just pray and ask the Lord, you know, is this, is this, is this going to bother you? Or is this something that I shouldn't, you don't think I should do? And again, like I said, there's a lot of people that are coming to Christ after they've been tattooed. So, you know, I'm not judging anyone. I just, I'm just saying that, you know, when we, are in this world we want to be different we want to look different we want to speak different we we should act different and when we look so much and act so much and talk so much like the world um i just don't think that that's very pleasing to god and like i said i'm preaching to myself today i'm not just preaching you know i'm not pointing fingers at anyone i i like i said i have some things that i need to work on my myself and uh and it's a hard road and um, it's two of the things that are in my nature that are just very much my nature. And so I have, I've been asking the Lord to help me crucify that flesh. I've been, I've bought some books and the other one that I wanted to, other one I wanted to talk about, which will be a separate devotional would, would be, um, anxiety. I'm having an issue and I never used to, but, uh, I'm having an issue with anxiety about things going on with my business and stuff. And so, um, I want to talk to you all about about anxiety because that's not of God either. And so hopefully this this has helped you all. I know it kind of sounds preachy and and like I'm pointing fingers and that's not how this was meant, but you know, the Bible tells us that the younger women are to learn from the older women. And there's a lot of younger women out there who who were raised in, in broken homes or they didn't have a godly motherly or grandmotherly influence. And so I'm here to try to, to be a grandmotherly influence, um, with some of our young ladies. Uh, they don't know any better. And I'm not saying that, you know, that they're doing it on purpose. They probably just don't know any better, uh, because nobody's told them. And so if we don't tell the truth, then they don't know the truth. And, so, you know, reading the word of God and pointing these things out uh, in God's word um, and remembering that we are not of this world. We are in it. We are not of it. The world is going to hate us for being different. It already does. I, I put up with this a lot. Um, I will probably get some ugly comments uh, after this video, but, you know, I've, I've grown a little bit thicker skin since those first videos and I've learned to move on and I've done what the Lord's told me to do and I, I just, I'll just move on and um, hopefully at some point in time they'll realize that uh, I was trying to speak out of love and um, so hopefully this has helped some of you all and uh, I, I appreciate your support and your love and, and a lot of you write lovely comments to me and you check on me. And so uh, I appreciate that. And just again, remember to uh, keep my mother in your prayers. I know where she's going. She's going to go to heaven and be with my dad. And she's going to be in a glorified body. And that, that's a good thing. So uh, we've just got to get through this rough patch um, of literally her watching her die. That's probably what's the hardest. So thank you all again for uh, watching. And uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. And God bless everybody. Bye-bye.